good to be back with you this morning. I hope you all had good Thanksgivings, not too much food or drink. I was in Denver for the uh, annual meeting of the American Academy of Religion, and then here for the holiday, my parents came to visit. We had Thanksgiving with some of their friends in Meyerland, and then we visited other friends of ours in Dallas. Throughout this whole course of events, I managed to keep myself to a single slice of pecan pie. That's probably why I can still fit into my suit this morning. I have to admit it hot, was hard because pecan pie is my favorite. Actually, I like pecan pie so much that I think of it as kind of an ordinary miracle. Ordinary miracles are the wondrous things that fill our human lives. Birth, death, the cycle of life, there's something about it that all transcends human comprehension. Even something as simple as a pecan pie can transcend human comprehension. There's a more... <laughs> now that was something I did not think I was going to name it on. There's an enormous amount of stuff that goes into making a pecan pie. There are the pecans, of course, products of the earth, wind, soil, sun, and an extraordinary amount of difficult human labor. So much has to happen even for these sweetmeats. And then there's the flour, the butter, that strange English treacle called Lyle's golden syrup. And then there's, of course, the necessity of having someone who actually knows how to bake a pie. And this is a skill that has enough nuance that mastery of it is a subject of much debate. Now, I don't know about your family, but in mine there are different schools of thought as how to prepare a good pie crust. Now everyone agrees on what a good pie crust is. It's light, flaky, slightly salty, and holds together under the fork. But few folks agree exactly on how to make it. Some clay claim that a good pie crust requires lard. Many object that the use of lard is, of course, not friendly to vegetarians. Others advocate for substituting a little bit of the water with some vodka. I tend to fall into the camp that says you freeze the butter before using it in the crust, and that that's what creates the tender bite. The ideal pecan pie somehow transcends these debates. It's a miracle that combines chemistry, human ingenuity, and even evolution. Sometimes when I eat pie, I can actually manage to remember all of this and recall that our lives are filled with mystery and wonder. The question is not, what is the best way to make a pie crust? The real question is, will we open ourselves to the mystery and wonder that surround us? I detect something of this line of questioning in Marge Piercy's Hanukkah poem, Season of Skinny Candles. When even the moon starves to a sliver of quicksilver, the little candles poke holes in the blackness. The holiday season is a time to remember the ordinary miracles that fill our lives. The candles that poke holes into the season's lessened light are reminders of the spark that resides within each of us. They are reminders that our universe is mysterious and wonderful. It is good to pause every now and again and just take it all in. It can be hard at this time of year to do so. I don't know about you, but I always find the stretch between Thanksgiving and New Year's to be an exceptionally busy time. In addition to all the family preparations, there's all the stuff that's happening in congregational life. There's events like last night's fantastic church auction, after which I'm afraid I need to apologize to my nearby neighbors for playing the kazoo rather too enthusiastically with my son. There are seasonal parties, and there are special worship services. This year we're holding a solstice service on the 21st, a Christmas pageant on the 23rd, and an evening service on the 24th. And these services offer us an opportunity to pause and reflect on the season. The Christmas services I lead follow a traditionally traditional format of lessons and carols. 
However, they vary in one substantive respect. I don't just draw from the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Instead, I use readings from the so-called non-canonical Gospels, ancient texts that tell stories about Jesus which didn't make it into the Christian New Testament. And I do this as a reminder that within the context of the broader Christian tradition, Unitarian Universalism is a heretical movement. Our views are closer to those people who were kicked out of the ancient Christian church <laughs> than those who formed it. We didn't happen to agree with the Roman emperors and theologians who created the doctrines central to contemporary Christianity. Take two examples, Arius and Origen of Alexandria, two early Christians whose theologies are held to be heretical by much of today's Christian orthodoxy. Arius preached that Jesus was a human being who had obtained perfection and then was adopted by God as God's child. Origen taught that at some point in the future there would be a perfect restoration of all creation. This is a version of universal salvation, the idea that in the end all souls will be united with God. Unitarian Universalism gets its name from these two ancient heresies. Unitarianism, the idea that Jesus was a human being rather than part of God, and Universalism, the story that God's love is all-powerful and that God condemn, condemns no one to hell. The past president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, William Sinkford, summarizes these theologies as one God, no one left behind. This view is one reason why contemporary Unitarian Universalists are often comfortable drawing wisdom from the world's religious traditions. We understand religion to be a universal human impulse. There are ordinary miracles to be found through engaging different rituals, stories, texts, teachers, and practices. This attitude has actually been with Unitarianism since its very inception. In 16th century Europe, Unitarianism emerged as what's called a hybrid faith. Almost 500 years ago, in places like Poland and Transylvania, Unitarianism developed as a, at the intersection of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Its practitioners recognized that adherents to all three religions were children of the same God. In her study of early European Unitarianism, Susan Ritchie observes, Convinced that Christians, Muslims, and Jews were part of the same religious family, Unitarians resisted theologies of God that could not be sh freely shared across these lines. They recognized the, that the miracle of human existence, which we humans share, cannot be captured by the teachings of a single tradition. As our own Unitarian Universalist Association puts it, our living tradition draws from the world's religions which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual lives. All of this goes some of the way to explaining why at this busy time of year we honor the Christian holiday of Christmas, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, and the turning of the year that is the winter solstice. It also helps explain how someone like me, who can identify, can identify with both Unitarian Universalism and Judaism, as I think I've told you before, I'm a product of an interreligious marriage. My mother was raised Moravian, my father was raised Jewish. And this meant that growing up, we celebrated both Christian and Jewish holidays, Hanukkah and Christmas, Easter and Passover, and that in my house, we still do. Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. Today and next Sunday, we are honoring both the Christmas season and Hanukkah as part of the service, we have some Hebrew songs, some Hanukkah poems, and next week we will light a special menorah called the Hanukkah. Carol will count on the basic outline of Hanukkah for the, earlier for the big idea. You'll recall that it celebrates the victory of a group of Jews called the Maccabees over a Greek king who decided to put an end to local religion. He forbid the practice of Judaism under pain of death. Pagan and rit rituals and sacrifices were intentionally practiced in the holy temple as a way to defile it. And eventually, when the Maccabees were victorious, they set out to rededicate the temple. They searched the temple for oil with which to light the temple lights. 
The Talmud, which is a Jewish text of teachings, relates, they searched and found only one bottle sealed by the high priest, and there was only enough for one oil only enough oil for one day's lighting. Yet a miracle was brought about with it, and they lit the lamps from it for eight days. Hanukkah commemorates the miracle of a single day's oil lasting for eight days. It's a tiny moment of divine agency, the only miracle within the extension of the light across eight days. Why eight days? Rabbi Arthur Wasco observes, since the whole universe was created in seven days, eight is a symbol of eternity and infinity. The eight days of light are a miracle that remind us that our world is filled with ordinary senses of miracles. The idea that the world is infused with this miracle of existence or the spirit of the divine is present in the teachings of many mystical and much of mystical Judaism. The great Jewish mystic Rabbi Pincus of Koretz is said to have explained the story of Hanukkah to his disciples this way. Listen, and I shall tell you the meaning of Hanukkah to the meaning, the meaning of light. The light which was hidden on that day since the days of creation was then revealed. And every year when the lights are lit for Hanukkah, the hidden light of creation is revealed afresh. And it is the light of the Messiah. Let's dwell on that last, second to last sentence for a moment. Every light, every year, when the lights are lit for Hanukkah, the hidden light is revealed afresh. This is the message of the season. Miracles are ever present in our lives. The hidden light of creation, the miracle of our existence, is waiting for us to rekindle it at all times. We need only to open ourselves to it, to find the ordinary miracle in the pie or in the light of the candlelight. I learned something of this years ago when I studied with a great scholar of Jewish mysticism, Paul Mendes Flor. When he taught, he always refused to close the classroom door. He said it was just possible, just maybe likely, that the Messiah, the great teacher who was going to come to redeem all humanity, was going to appear. And he didn't want to miss the announcement if it came. <laughs> A miracle, the light of creation, always just on the cusp of shining forth. This was the central teaching of Rabbi Pincus. Pincus lived in the Ukraine during the 18th century. He was companion to the great rabbi Israel ben Elizer, more commonly known as the Baal Shem Tov. The words of the Baal Shem Tov in Hebrew mean the master of the good name. He taught that the world is full of enormous lights and mysteries, and that we can find them if we open ourselves to them. It is alleged that he knew the secret name of God and that he was a great miracle worker. One story has it that once he prayed on Shabbos in a field full of sheep, and the sheep were so moved by his prayers that they assumed the original position with which they had worshipped at the throne of God. Other stories relate that he was regularly visited by the seven shepherds of Israel, ancient biblical figures whose numbers include Abraham and Moses. So others tell of how he could travel great distances quickly and appear mysteriously to provide counsel for the perplexed. But most of the stories about him are about finding the miraculous in the everyday, of discovering after gathering for an evening service that the night had suddenly grown light in greater radiance than ever before, the moon curved on a flawless sky. Unlike Rabbi Pincus, Baal Shem Tov does not appear to have left any teachings about Hanukkah. And this is perhaps because it is actually a relatively minor Jewish holiday. It fits a general pattern of resistance to persecution commemorated by many Jewish holidays and summarized by some rabbis as, they tried to kill us, they didn't kill us, let's eat. The special food of Hanukkah, of course, being latkes, potato pancakes fried in oil to commemorate the miracle of the light. 
The holiday itself doesn't actually even appear in the Hebrew Bible. Its story is recounted in the books of Maccabees, which, were, which are texts preserved by Greek Christians. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Purim, Passover are all much more important to the Jewish tradition. Yet starting in the 19th century, it became central to Jewish life. As, Christmas, as the Christmas season itself became more increasingly commercial, many Jewish families wanted to match the excitement of the Christmas holiday with its bright lights and feasts and trees and carols and presents. Some Jewish parents even wanted their kids to experience the thrill of Santa Claus. They surprised their kids with fairly extravagant gifts. Now, in my father's family, this took on something of an absurd twist. When my father and his siblings were little, my grandmother, Lorraine, decided that the joy of latkes and dreidel and Hanukkah gelt and gifts were not quite enough. And so she invented something she called the Hanukkah birdie. The Hanukkah birdie was a bird who brought Jewish children gifts throughout the eight nights. <laughs> eight nights of Hanukkah. <laughs> And my grandmother rarely ever did anything halfway. So she actually commissioned an artist to paint a Hanukkah birdie mural on a cloth that could be hung in my grandparents' house. That featured a bird carrying presents in its beak, uh, carrying presents in its beak. And each year at Hanukkah time, my grandmother would take out the mural and her kids would know that the holiday had arrived. My father remembers somewhat charitably, it gave us something tangible like our Christian friends had. Now, it would be easy to make the story of my grandmother and the Hanukkah birdie a story about assimilation, especially since only about half of her grandchildren fall under the category of observant Jews. But I draw a somewhat different lesson. The human desire for miracles is something that transcends time and culture. We never know where we might find them. By creating the Hanukkah birdie, my grandmother was trying to offer her children something of that sense of the miracle. And one of, one of our central religious tasks, after all, is to open ourselves to those miracles. It is to kindle the light of creation, as Rampire Pincus would have Jews do, or find the miraculous in nature, as the Baal Shem Tov taught. You might hear in all of this some kind of theistic position, some kind of argument for the existence of God. That is not the message of this, this sermon or the point of the candles of hope that we kindle at the holiday time. Instead, I'm suggesting we approach the world like the great mystics. Louis Gluck takes such an approach in her poem, Celestial Music. You will recall it is a dialogue between a theist and an atheist. There's no resolution to the theological positions in the poem. Instead, Gluck writes, In my dreams, my friend reproaches me. We're walking on the same road, except it's winter now. And she's telling me that when you love the world, you hear celestial music. Look up, she says. When I look up, nothing. Only cloud, snow, a white business in the trees, like brides leaping to a great height. Celestial music, white business in the trees, either one a miracle, either available to us like the lights of the season, like nature itself each day of our lives. Pecan pie, the flames of the Hanukkah, Pearls of lights on the Christmas tree, great teachings of the mystics, the wisdom of our own Unitarian Universalist tradition. May all these things remind us of a simple fact. The world is filled with ordinary miracles. We can encounter them each day of our lives. May the congregation say, Amen. <laughs>